Well, um, a few just family things. So uh, just got back from vacation, so that was nice. So we got to spend a little bit of spring break over in Seattle where our oldest daughter, Lauren, and her husband, Jacob, they live in Shoreline. And um, he's finishing up his master's degree. She's finishing up her bachelor's, getting ready to go into teaching. He's getting ready to go into family counseling or family therapy. So it was just fun to see them and uh, do some family dinners and play board games and just be dumb together. Um, and then the other excuse for the trip was, um, was to buy a college cello for Elizabeth because she's a music major this fall. Um, Y'all might, might be aware that, that, that she, she plays music. I, could you hear the difference with the cello today? I don't know if you could or not. Around our house, we can. So this, this one, is a, it's, a, it's a bit of an upgrade. We, we've moved from kind of you know, high, junior high, high school level to sort of college level, and it's, a, it's exciting. I, except for she reminded me, she had the audacity to remind me this morning that we, we've got eight more weeks with her before, before she hit, tries to head off to camp and then tries to go ahead. So I'm having a bit of a rough day <laughs> because I just love her so much. And anyways, whew. but, um, but, but all that to say, just uh, thanks for a little bit of time away. And thanks, thanks Paul, uh, for carrying extra load. Um, for, did you enjoy Peter's song? Yeah. Wasn't he good? Great, great speaker. So I'm just I'm grateful to hear that message. It's just so challenging. We need to hear that. To see Ian growing, trying new things, even doing a little smaller team. So can we just give some of these folks a hand? And of course, today uh, is Palm Sunday. And so I need to ask you an important, important question. What do you think is the most pressing need in the world right now? Just shout it out. Most important need. Love, okay. Peace, yeah, with a good thing. Places like Ukraine, absolutely. Peace, what else? Jesus, yep. Yeah. What else are you hearing? Faith, Faith yep. Yep, so I was thinking you might even get more concrete than that. Like, you know, we got political problems, we got unrest, um, you know, environmental, all those things, right? There's lots and lots of things going on in the world. Um, if you're online, you can, you can maybe post uh, you know, what you believe is the most pressing or most important problem in the world today. Now, you don't need to shout this one out necessarily, but what's the most important or most pressing issue in your life right now? See, all of us have got things we're asking for God's help for. You know, if you've... If you've encountered God in your life, or more specifically, if you've encountered Jesus in your life, you have some awareness that Jesus is powerful and he's capable, and so we call out to him for the things that we need. And as we are feeling the pressing need, whether that's a political one, you know, like, you know, like, like, political freedom, or places like the Ukraine, uh, geo, geopolitical, so international. Or maybe it's, you know, maybe it's just you're concerned about the direction our country is going. I am. And so we call out to God, God, would you heal our nation? Please. Move in our midst. Move in our land. So maybe your, your primary concern is more kind of political or national or something like that. We call out to God, God, would you help? Would you help or maybe it's more financial. If you're in a money crisis, you got a crisis and it's probably on your mind all the time. God, would you help with our family's need? Please, help these ends to meet somehow. Or maybe it's relational. You know, you've got a loved one that's hurting or maybe you're distanced from a friend or a, or a family member and, and that's the thing that's on your heart. God, I know you can heal relationships. I know you can do, do something there. Would you please do something in, in this situation? Or maybe for some, it's medical. You've got a medical need. If you've got a medical need in your family, that's going to that's gonna be right top of, top of mind awareness, right? You, you don't need to put your hands up. But we know that Jesus is capable. We know he's able. And so we call out to him. And the scriptures encourage us to do that. Like we're supposed to go to God with like a, 
like a child goes to a really good dad. I mean, you, he already knows what's on your heart. He already knows what's on your mind. So Lord, please, please, please help, help, please help. I know you can do this. I've seen you make a difference. I've seen you do miracles in my life. I've seen you do miracles in history. Please, please help. Can you relate to that? Yeah, because all of us, on some level, we have an agenda for Jesus. And that's okay. Because, because those are things that are in our world and in our lives that are honestly important. God, fix our land. Heal our nation. Provide for my family. Heal broken relationships. Or make good relationships better. And Jesus, I know, you can, I know you can physically heal people. And there's people I care about. Or maybe there's worries in my own life. Please. We've all got an agenda for Jesus. It's legitimate. We can talk to Jesus about it. And, or I might say, but. This passage... And, this, and the message of Palm Sunday, it both affirms the fact that we have needs we come to God with. We have agendas for Jesus. He understands that. And we have to be very careful that our agenda for Jesus doesn't cause us to not see the larger picture that God, that Jesus has his own agenda. Jesus didn't just come to be the answer to my problems. He didn't just come to be the answer to our problems. He didn't just come to be the answer to your problems. Let me see your eyes. He came to be the answer, period. And so as we read this passage... We're going to find ourselves, I think, kind of empathizing with what the crowd is experiencing. They have seen the power of Jesus, and so they're waving these palm branches. They're just like we, you know, this, the worship we experienced this morning. We're just, we're just thankful, grateful. And we, we can relate to the praise. We can relate to the, to the celebration that Jesus is showing up. And if we're really honest, and I hope we can be here, we're also going to be able to relate to why some of those same people, probably most of those same people that were waving palm branches and throwing Jesus a parade would five days later be part of crying out, crucify him. Because Jesus didn't meet their agenda. Jesus didn't do what, what they thought he should do for them. And as we enter into this passage, don't you I just love God's word because every time I come to a, pa you know, a passage, even ones I've read again and again, and you've, I mean, if you've been in church, you know, for more than a year or two, you've heard like this, the Palm Sunday story, right? So you've probably heard the Palm Sunday story before. Well, there's a part of the Palm Sunday story in Luke that I'm a little ashamed to say I never really really got before. It's like plain as day right there. But there's some parts of the story that um, as I was reading it afresh this year just knocked my socks off. It's a, a part of, of what happened on that Palm Sunday that I had missed that actually tells me so much about who Jesus is. So I, I, I hope you'll have some of that same kind of insight moment as we journey in it together. You ready to go? Ready to go through, the, through uh, Luke Luke chapter 19, okay, so you, we're going to be in the book of Luke, chapter 19, if you got your paper Bibles, open them up, keep me honest, okay, you can, you can uh, if you've got your version Bible app on your phone, okay, silence it, so if you're playing video games, the people won't know, but you just, you, you, version. but follow along, in, we're going to be in Luke chapter 19, it's a familiar passage that, that, um, well, we're going we're gonna to talk about some of the little nuances of it, and then we're going to move into the part of the passage that you might not have really heard before. Maybe. We'll see. Okay? Tell, tell me later if, that, if, that, uh, if some of this is new to you. Okay. Luke chapter 19. 
starting with verse 28. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. He approached Bethphage and Bethany. These are towns on the way to Jerusalem. At the hill called the Mount of Olives, and he sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. It's a brand new convertible. No one's ever driven it. Okay? He's, he's going to find a colt tied there. Untie the colt and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, which they will, why are you untying my brand new colt? Okay. Why are you untying it? Keep me honest. Okay. Why are you untying it? You just say to them, the Lord needs it. So uh, those who were sent ahead went and they found it. That colt, just as it had been told to them, as they were untying the colt, the owners asked them, why are you untying my colt? That's a good question. And they replied, what'd they say? And they brought it to Jesus. Quick pause, and it worked. That is, that's that strange thing Jesus does number one today. Who does that? Who does that? Yeah, Jesus can. Jesus does. I have a feeling if I asked you, you got a new car, can I borrow it for youth group? <laughs> Think I, I think I know the answer. You should answer no, by the way. Just that would be the right answer. I've done youth ministry for many years. There's a reason why, you know, the youth ministry church vans are, because that's exactly the state they should be in. <laughs> anyways, anyways, so it, we'll get back on track. I'm, all, I'm having fun here. So they brought it to Jesus, verse 35. They threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, so this on their way into Jerusalem, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. So this is from Psalm 118, verse 26. It's a coronation song. It's a victory march giving thanks to God as the king is heading towards the temple. So this, this, this is, this, this, a king is on his way. A king is on his way. Peace in, what's the word? Heaven. Heaven. So it's not just an earthly king. It's a heaven. heavenly king. This is a big deal. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now, the, the gospel of Matthew and the gospel of Mark includes also the words Hosanna or Hosanna uh, in the highest, which is a word that it's a, an expression of praise, but it means save us or please save us or you are our savior. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now. Yeah. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd, they said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Dial it down, pastor. <laughs> Dial it down. Don't get ahead of yourself. I tell you, Jesus replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. So quick pause before we move on to the other part of the passage. So keep your Bibles open. So let's talk about why there is so much intensity in the crowd. Because there's lots of intensity in the crowd. See, the, the, this, the, this crowd, they've heard the stories of Jesus, kind of like John alluded to. You know, that of Jesus' miracles, he's raised the dead, he has fed thousands of people, the, the, the blind are seeing, the deaf are, heal, are being healed, lepers are being cleansed. This is a miracle worker, and they are looking for a miracle working leader. Do you know why? Because their land had been, is occupied by the Romans. In B.C. 63, you know, the, the, um, the Roman army took over Jerusalem. This is now about A.D. 30. So it's been about 90-ish years. 90 years under political oppression. 
under political occupation. Now, I imagine if I was to ask the congregation, who here is standing with the Ukraine right now, you would probably be like, I am. Why? Because this is an independent, democratic nation that, that, had, a, that you know, had a communist regime take it over or try to take it over. This is wrong. Nations should live free. We understand, even, even if we don't you know, empathize with every piece of the politics, we understand why the people of Ukraine are, are like, why so many are staying in the nation to fight for their country. We get that, right? Because people want to, want to govern themselves and they want to be free. That's right. That's the way that's supposed to be. And that's what the Israelites are feeling. They've been under Roman occupation for 90 years. That's a long time. Now, over those years, um, a little bit of historical background here, there, there's kind of three major groups in Israel. Now, not everybody fits neat, neatly and tidily into one of those three groups. So the people, like the average person on the street, kind of, level, kind of like, you know, in our world, people fall into different places on the political spectrum. But there were three major groups, and I just want to kind of outline that for you. It might be helpful. So one, there was the Sadducees. So these were people that were, often they were more wealthy, but they, um, their, their, their approach to how, to how to navigate this Roman problem was predominantly political. Was the, you know, we, we pro we've tried to kick them out. We can't kick them out. Uh, it's, it's, this is the most powerful army on the planet. So, let's do what we can. We're going we're gonna to advocate for the needs of our people. We're going to work with those powers. We don't like any of those powers, but at least we're going to work with them to try to do what is best for the people. They're, they're pragmatists. They're just trying to work it out. And none of them are here in this crowd. They're, they're, they're not here on, on Palm Sunday. They're, they're doing other things. Um, but, you know, that, that's one of the groups. They're, they're, tr they're, they're just trying to, they don't like the Romans, but you got to accommodate them enough because we want to do what's right for the nation. And arguably, um, one of the byproducts of Roman rule is that actually quite a bit of wealth had come into the nation. Not necessarily to the average Joe, but to the upper echelons. Of society. The, the temple had been rebuilt and it was incredibly opulent. The wealthy were quite wealthy. So the Pharisees were working with that. So that's one group. The, the second group, oh sorry, the Sadducees were working with that. I, I misspoke. The second group, Freudian slip, the Pharisees. The Pharisees. And these, they, they were here at the story. You, you remember what they were, they were saying. They were trying to tell Jesus to dial it down. Because see, their approach, their approach to, to trying to solve this Roman problem was predominantly spiritual. They, they came with the idea that if we, just, if we just get our holiness right, like if we can just live rigidly by the, by the Torah, God will deliver us. From the Romans. So they were, they were, rightly they were pursuing holiness. They were pursuing righteousness. They were trusting God. For the answers. But Jesus didn't exactly fit their mold of what holiness looked like. Jesus came in and he wasn't looking religious in the ways that they expected Jesus to look. He's interacting with people that the religious elite would never want to interact with. Sinners, tax collectors, even prostitutes. Jesus was welcoming people that should not be welcomed in, in polite settings into his group. So... That's why the Pharisees, had, they, they, they were interested in Jesus because, wow, look at the miracles. Look what God is doing. But they were deeply skeptical about 
Jesus, deeply concerned. He was doing righteousness all wrong. Third group, these were the zealots. These are the people, you might see them in the marketplace, they're not trying to cause trouble, but they're collecting sidearms in the back room. Um, they were, it's likely zealots were in the crowd, so they're waving palm branches, but they got a little dagger right kind of by their side. They're not looking for trouble, but if trouble comes, they're ready for it. They are waiting for a chance, for a military solution. And if a leader comes, if the kind of leader that we've been praying for finally comes, one who has the power to, I mean, the, the same person who could raise the dead or feed 5,000 people, don't you think he could show up in Jerusalem and, I don't know, wave a stick or a, like a staff like Moses and a plague comes and wipes out all the Romans or swallows them up or something? I mean, it's happened in biblical history. God's used leaders to do stuff like that. Earthquake, I don't care. Just get rid of these people. And when, they, when it's time, I'll be ready. I'll be ready. Now, not everybody fit neatly into those three camps, but those are the three general approaches. The pragmatist, political solution, the holiness, religious solution, or, well, as need be, the military solution. If, God forbid, we imagine what it would be like to live in the United States if we were an occupied nation. Room got quiet, right? Imagine if some foreign power was uh, oppressing us. Or for those of you who are joining us in Canada, if there was an occupying nation. I mean, some of you right now, you, you, just, you just recalled the combination to your gun safe. Because you're like, well, I don't, I'm not looking for trouble, but if trouble comes, I'm ready. I, I, I may or may not have enlisted in the, in the armed forces in the past, but I'm signed up now. And you would do kind of whatever it takes to bring freedom to the nation. Now, I'm not looking for a show of hands, but see, we, we can feel that. We can feel that tension, can't we? And that's what the Israelites are experiencing in this moment. Jesus, this miracle-working Leader shows up and whether you're a Pharisee and thinking, okay, maybe he's going to get it right this time and, and then holiness and God and, or maybe you're more like a zealot and you're like, well, I'm not looking for trouble but if this is the guy, I'm by his side. I'm ready to rock. Click, click. Whatever it is. There was a lot of expectation in this moment. The crowd, they had an agenda for Jesus. And if we're honest, we can relate. If you were in that situation, if I was in that situation, I'd be, I'd be somewhere on that spectrum with an agenda for Jesus. The number one problem from an Israelite perspective, the number one problem in their world at least, is these Romans. And here's somebody who can do something about it. That's why I'm so excited. I'll throw them a parade any and every day of the week. Because it's go time. And that's why this next part of the passage, the part that honestly I've missed over the years, and maybe you have too, is so impactful. Jesus does something really, really strange. Some, some of you, like you're already checking your Bibles. Good. You know, he does something really, really strange. Okay, you ready to read on with me? Okay. As he approached Jerusalem, so this is while, the, while this parade is happening. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he, what did he do? He wept. Jesus wept. These weren't tears of joy. I want to thank the academy. This wasn't that. Jesus was, Jesus was weeping. He was sad. He was busted up. He's weeping. Why is he weeping? He wept over it and said, If you, 
if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it is hidden from your eyes. Perhaps in other words to say, your solu the solution is right in front of you and you cannot see it. And he's talking about Jerusalem, but I believe he's also talking about the crowd. Because they are right there. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in from every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and your children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another. Why? Because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Have you heard that part of the passage before? That's the part I missed. If only you had known this day, what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. Who does this? Who, is, who ends up weeping at their own victory parade? This is another bizarre thing that Jesus does. Who does this? Well, Jesus does. Now, here's a part of the story that I just find so fascinating. Okay, so Jesus is he's coming into Jerusalem. He knows what his mission is. He knows how this week is going to end. He's already been talking to his disciples about this. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to die. He's told this. Now, the disciples haven't picked up on this yet because that just seems sounds like crazy talk for them at the moment. He knows this is about to be the most stressful, tiring, overwhelming week of his life. I mean, more is written about these next few days of Jesus' life than any other part of the Bible, period. This is literally the most important days in history. Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, knows this is about to happen. And in the, in the same moment as he's recognizing this, he is prophesying about an event that is going to happen 40 years into the future. 40 years. Because in April of the, of the year 70, um, A.D., around the same time as the Passover. So this could be literally 40 days from the day, okay? The Roman general Titus besieged Jerusalem. Here's what, here's what he did. Now, since that action coincided with Passover, the Romans allowed pilgrims to come into the city so they can come in for Passover. They can have their big feasts, bring in all the food, eat everything, and then they refused to let anyone leave. And at the same time, they, they cut off all supply chains, all food and all water to the city of Jerusalem. The Romans encircled the city so that it would drive the Jews to starvation. And in August of that same year, a few months later, after the people had starved because they'd completely run out of food and they'd completely run out of water, the city and the temple were completely destroyed. In exactly, let me see your eyes, exactly the way Jesus prophesied. Exactly. In fact, the nation of Israel would not exist as a nation again until May 14 of 1948. And Jesus was weeping about this moment even as he is anticipating this week. He is... Who does that? Jesus. 
If you really want to have your mind blown, okay, the Gospel of Luke was probably written about A.D. 60. So as Luke is recording this weird, weird thing, you know, that Jesus did during, during the triumphal entry, it would still be 10 years later that it would be fulfilled. Even Luke, as he is recording this for us to read 2,000 years later, Luke didn't even realize how true these words Jesus was prophesying would be. Who does that? Who knows the future like that? Who? Jesus. Jesus. I mean, if, if stories like this don't just cause us to go, oh my Jesus is a leader like no one else in history. A passage like this should get us thinking. Jesus, well, there's at least three things that Jesus is different and better than any other human leader. First thing, Jesus knows more. Now, I'm telling you, every leader, whether you're an organizational leader or every politician will try to Tell, tell you what the future holds. If you do this, and if you do this, it'll lead to this. You've, you've heard that speech before, right? Now, do politicians really know what's going to happen in the future? No. They just act like they do. Even, even good organizational leaders that are trying to lead an organization to a, to a preferred future, the truth is you're just kind of guessing. And you're Trying to lay out something optimistic that people will follow. Jesus actually knows. He knows so much that even at the beginning of his final week, he prophesied with tremendous detail an event that would happen 40 years in the future. Literally. Who does that? Jesus. Jesus knows more. Jesus sacrifices more. I mean, that's not to say that good human leaders don't sacrifice. They do. And we honor those sacrifices, and we should. But nobody... Nobody has sacrificed more than Jesus. He knew exactly what was coming, both that, later that week and 40 years in the future, and he was there anyway. Who does that? Only Jesus. Third reason Jesus is a better leader than any human leader, or any other merely human leader, because Jesus was fully human, he's also fully God, and this is the moment where we see that, is that Jesus offers citizenship into a kingdom that lasts. His kingdom, and his kingdom alone, will have no end. Only Jesus. And so if we really hear this passage today, it will help us to Keep things in perspective. Now, so for example, with the Israelites, as they're, as they're longing for that political solution, because they're concerned about the future of their country, they were so concerned about Jesus solving that political problem that they missed the larger agenda of what Jesus was there to do. They missed it. In fact, many of them five days later would be so disappointed that Jesus didn't come up and open up a can and whoop it on the, on the Romans that, that they would be calling for his crucifixion. Now for the needs in your life, in my life, and they, they're real, they're pressing. Sometimes they're scary. I got them. I know you do too. And it is okay to call out to God. It's okay to cry out to God. 
He wants to hear what you have to say. He really, really does. We've got to be so careful that we don't kind of judge God on, on how well he serves our purposes for him. Jesus is not just there to solve your problems. Can he? Yes. Will he solve them in the way that you want? I don't know. See, Jesus has his own agenda. And the Israelites missed it. I want to return to that verse for just a moment. The verse 42. Even you, if you'd only known on this day what would bring you peace. But it's been hidden from your eyes. The answer is standing right before you. And they couldn't see it. Same thing can happen to us. The answer is right in front of us. And sometimes we just can't see it because we are... Because our agenda for Jesus somehow feels more important than Jesus' agenda for, for us. We pray this in the Lord's Prayer each week. Let your kingdom come and may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's one of the reasons why I think we need to pray that prayer on a regular basis, whether that's in church settings or just on your own. Because it is so easy to put our kingdom in front of Jesus' kingdom. And when we do, we can really get our, get our heads turned in the wrong direction. And that's not to say that we can't come to Christ with the honest needs in our life. Or, or if you think about what it means to be a church, you know, in, in the church in America, post-pandemic, I'm so grateful that Peter was speaking about that last week. I thought it was excellent. We've got to be really careful. Because see, we know, for example, in church marketing that if you attach Jesus to one of those basic felt needs of humanity, your church is going to grow faster. So if you attach Jesus to desired political solutions and you embrace Christian nationalism, for example, come to Jesus for the sake of the nation. Come to Jesus because it will help to save America. Now on some level, it's, let's be honest, that's true, by the way. Because blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. There is nothing better that we can do for our country than to give our hearts to Christ. Do you realize that your discipleship is actually more impactful on the future of our nation than your vote? Well, I better say that again. Your discipleship is more impactful on the future of our nation than your vote. And I hope you vote. I hope you pray about what you vote. I hope you pray wisely and well for people of character and for causes that matter. But the real test of our nation is not what's going to happen in the ballot box. It's whether or not the people who know Jesus act like it. We gotta, but we got to be careful because we're going to see these trends. Because they've always been there. We attach our faith to our national desires, our political desires, whether left or right or whatever. And we try to get, you know, Jesus will help me accomplish my political agenda, so let's, let's, let, let's follow Jesus together. Or maybe it's financial. And you see churches that rise with the kind of the health and wealth gospel. If you serve Jesus, he's going to make you, he's going to bless your life. He's going to make you rich. And on some level, that's true. Because here, here's the thing. When, when our, we surrender our finances to the Lord and we, and we pursue generosity, a life of generosity, and, and we start to release our grip on our money, and we realize that every resource in our life belongs to Jesus. Well, Jesus generally does. I have yet to meet a person who is a long-term, lifetime tither that has long-term money problems. I've yet to meet that person. Because God tends to generally bless those who are looking to honor God with their finances. But we got to be careful because otherwise we can be seeking Jesus because of the finances. 
And the finances become the agenda rather than Jesus. Now, some, I'm, I'm pushing some of you, aren't I? This is good. Welcome to church. Okay, or relationships. We long for relationships, rightly. These, this is what makes life matter. Can Jesus help to fix your marriage? Yeah, that might be the Holy Spirit showing up or it could be the AC. Let's find out. Now, so... <laughs> Anyways, so does Jesus, does, can Jesus make your family stronger? Yes, he can. Yes, he can. Are, are God-honoring Christian marriages generally stronger and happier? Yes, they are. But that's not the reason we come to Jesus. Or, or Jesus and medical. Because if you have a medical need and, and, or if you have a loved one with a medical need, those things feel huge. Of course they feel huge. Of course we should come to God about it. But we also see sometimes churches market that. You know, the, 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 where faith healing. The reason why you come to Jesus is because of your need for healing. That's the bait. Now, can Jesus heal? Answer is yes. yes. Will Jesus always heal in the way that we want? No. no. Can we trust that he'll give what is needed and what is best, that he has a better plan for us and our loved ones than, than we do? Yes. we got to be so careful. Because the thing is, it seems that that Jesus' opinion of what the most important problem in the world is, is different than ours. Now, that doesn't diminish the, the, the importance of the things we've identified already. But I believe this might be a good way to put it. I believe Jesus might say something like this. The number one problem in the world is this, that people are separated from God. The number one problem in the world is that people are separated from God. So we've got, that, that's, what, that's what sin does. Sin separates us from God. It separates us from one another. And as our relationship with God is restored, we begin to experience that same peace, that same shalom, that same right living with the relationships around us, with our finances, and yes, with our nation. Yes, with our bodies and healing. In fact, Jesus puts it this way. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. The number one problem in the world is that people are separated from God. That's why Jesus came. He knew more. And he gave more. And he offers more. He is not just the answer to your immediate problem, though he is the answer to your immediate problem. Even more than that, Jesus is the answer, period. Period. So as we enter into Holy Week, um, I'd like to challenge you a little bit. Um, will you take out that palm cross again? Because here's what I would ask you to do. Is on that cross, and, and there's going to be pens on, in the, the chairs in front of you. And if you're joining us online, you maybe don't have a palm cross in your hand. You, you could still just, you could write down in the comments how, how you would answer this, if you like. But I would invite you, with, with, with a pen, is write your message to Jesus on, on the cross somewhere. And maybe it would be something a little bit like this. I'm going to push you just a little bit. Lord, I surrender my agenda to yours. Now you can put that in whatever way you like, or maybe, you don't, maybe that's not actually what you want to say to the Lord this week. That's okay too. You don't need to do something just because I told you to. Please test everything I say against the scriptures. Please. Or on mine here, I just simply wrote, Your kingdom come. Lord, 
I've got the things I'm asking you to do. And they're real. But more than anything, God, I want you to do in my life what you want to do in my life. You are God whether you do what I hoped you would do or not. And I'm going to trust that your plans for me are better than my plans for me. I'm still going to come to you with what I care about. Please do. Your Father wants to hear from you. But I would challenge you to write something like that. Maybe even take that with you this week. Please don't miss Holy Week. Let's not just fast forward to Easter. Let's remember what Jesus did. Let's remember what Jesus gave. Lord, I surrender my agenda to yours. Would you pray with me? Lord, I don't want to miss what you're doing in my life. Lord, we don't want to miss what you're doing in this world. Help my heart to be open to you. Lord, I'm going to tell you what I'm thinking about. I'm going to tell you what's on my mind. But more than anything, God, I want to know what's on your heart. I want to know what's on your mind. And if in this moment right now, even as you're praying, if you're feeling distant from God, this could be a great time to turn your life over to him again. Lord, I surrender. I surrender my agenda. I surrender my life. I give it to you, Jesus. And if you need to say something to the Lord under your breath right now, I invite you to just do that. I give myself to you, Lord. Amen. Have you ever noticed that there are some people I just don't get? And they probably don't get me either. As parents and grandparents, that's going to be especially true of our own children and grandchildren. But the differences are not just generational, nor sinful. But our differences are that we are wired differently. And healthy relationships require that we understand that wiring. In this four-week group, we're going to be exploring concepts from a book by Kathleen Edelman called A Grown-Up's Guide to Kids' Wiring. To explore how different temperaments can relate to one another in more constructive ways. Along the way, you're gonna learn more about your spouse, your kids, your grandkids, your neighbors, your coworkers, your friends, and probably yourself. And I think we'll have some fun too. I hope you'll join us. Grandparents, we have a connection group just for you. We're Ray and Catherine Dobbs, and grandparenting is God's most important role for us right now, passing on the legacy of our faith in Christ to our grandkids. We have 10 grandkids, and we thought we were doing a pretty good job. But over the last six years, we've learned so much. It's called intentional Christian grandparenting. We'd like to share some of those tools with you and hear what works best for you. We'll support each other, pray for each other, and learn from each other. Join us for a deeper dive into intentional Christian grandparenting Thursday evenings at 6.30 at Columbia Grove Church. Hi Columbia Grove, Debbie Garrow here. I wanted to tell you about our Wednesday evening in the Bible group. We meet by Zoom from 6.30 to 8 o'clock on Wednesday evenings and it's a great group of people. We start with about 15 minutes of conversation, then we have a quick prayer and then we dive into God's Word. Um, reading it, discussing it together, 
And then we leave about 15 minutes at the end for prayer requests and praise reports, and then we pray together to end our evening. Uh, we've just begun reading Genesis together, but there's still plenty of time to join in, and we invite you to come and be a part of our group. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm Elizabeth, and if you've ever wanted to learn ukulele, I will be um, doing a beginner's ukulele class. And if you don't have a ukulele, don't worry about it. We have a few that you're completely welcome to borrow. Um, so I'd love to see you there.